Siegel Talks at the Montney Siegel Theater Center at the Great Graduate Center CUNY of the City University in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Frank Hinschke and I'm running the Siegel Talks actually since March uh, uh, when we talk to theater artists from New York City, from uh, uh, America, North America, the Americas, Canada and all around the world. We have done our over 100 talks focusing on the time of Corona and uh, how it is changing our lives, how it is questioning our fundamental essential beliefs and why we do it, what is really necessary, what should be done and what is wrong and what can be corrected and showing ways uh, perhaps and uh, how we can come out of this crisis within a crisis of a crisis to come out stronger. Um, after our short break in the summer, we went back uh, and uh, looked a little bit about theater performance and the political and the impact it does have uh, on our communities and our lives and our political movements. And um, and now, again, we had one week break at over Thanksgiving and we are back and uh, we are continuing our uh, investigation. We had uh, this last month's uh, sessions or week-long sessions on the idea of dramaturgy, on new dramaturgies, on uh, theater of the real, uh, the theater of uh, documentary theater with Carol Martin, Peter Akasal was here for the dramaturgy sessions. And now we are having again a variety of talks uh, this week and for next week. And today we have with us a, a worker um, in the vineyard of the uh, uh, American theater, which we think uh, very highly of at the Siegel Center. And um, it is uh, Sam Bogellen, and he's a Canadian American, we could now say, a theater director and translator. And he founded something unique. He founded um, Cherry Artist Collective, or Cherry Arts, as uh, we call it. It's up in Ithaca, in New York State. And for five years, it has now worked up there. And it has premiered plays from Argentina, France, Germany, Quebec, Morocco, Serbia, El Salvador, also of course, American US place, and uh, it has been commissioned uh, by the communities. They are deeply involved, I think, in the uh, work out there. And this is one of the things we've been looking at here. You know, how is theater changing? Will it go on in metropolitan communities like New York City? What will happen? Hillary Miller will come with us next week and talk about uh, New York City and when it was declared as drop dead in the 70s and now perhaps also is a time where it's very, very hard to, to do theater in New York. So what alternatives? We spoke to Stacey Klein uh, from uh, the double-edged sword out in the farm. We spoke to circus artists. Eugenio Barba was here, who famously lives in that small town in, uh, in Denmark and changed completely. And we see uh, Cherry Arts as a part of this. And um, he has directed a lot in New York City, actually, with the okay. great uh, Ohio Theater, the where he's now artistic associate, and also New York Theater Workshop, the Atlantic Club Thumb here, and as uh, Jack and so many others, kind of uh, the hit list of all the important places of what we think. And he has directed over twenty productions. Was part of Encatanio's great Lincoln director, Lincoln Center's director's lab. And uh, also he has taught at NYU Tisch, Hunter College, SUNY Ithaca College, and the great uh, uh, Cornell uh, University. So, um, Sam, uh, normally we say, where are you? What time is it? But I think <laughs> I gave it a little bit away. But still, tell us a little bit. Where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm in Ithaca, New York. Um, I was just reminded, I was on a TCG call yesterday. I was just reminded that um, it is important to say that we are on the unceded lands of the Cayuga Nation, uh, but uh, what we now call uh, Ithaca, New York, among some circles. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm here at home, not at the Cherry Arts Space, although we chatted a little about how one goes there now. Um, the theater is not open as a theater, but we, we can at least show up there and do our administrative thing. Uh, thank you for all of that. I should say, by way of like disclaimer, um, uh, uh, as one puts in one's bio, directed or developed works at the following. I have not directed major main stage productions at every big theater in New York, although lots of developmental work in my time yeah. there. I didn't know the scene uh, very well. So are you directed directly in Ithaca? Where's your theater located? Tell us a little bit about Cherry Arts. Yeah, thank you. The, so the Cherry Arts space is in Ithaca. Um, and uh, for those that don't know, we're a small, 
town with a sort of big arts presence because uh, the town of Ithaca is home to Cornell University and Ithaca College uh, and TC3 uh, uh, Tompkins Community College, which is Tompkins Cortland Community College, which is uh, also a very strong community college. And so it's got a very large faculty, grad student, student presence here. And um, so in a funny way, like after, you know, some, you know, many years of being based in New York and freelance directing at regional theaters. Um, honestly, my partner uh, has a faculty job at Cornell and uh, it seemed time to build a theater and a community uh, uh, of theater makers here around some of the sort of, uh, what were for me, emerging as real exciting imperatives of ways to make work that aren't made uh, so often in the US like uh, international plays, Actually, what we say is radically local, radically global, and formally innovative. So those are our three collective thrusts. Um, so uh, we try, <laughs> basically, we try to not like take plays from New York. Um, everybody looks to New York for plays. I lived in New York for a long time. I love New York. Um, but we thought, well, there are a lot of other places that great plays are coming from around the world. And like, what are things that theaters can do even before all this COVID situation that film can't do, for example. And uh, one of those things uh, in an important way was to work in and about the community and the histories of the community and make work right where one is about that place and those people. And so we aim to do a kind of very nearby, very far away balance. And of course that, that balance, like all balances has been upset now, but that was the sort of, um, that was a sort of initial impetus where a collective of artists who were by and large faculty members at uh, Ithaca College, which as many know has a really extraordinary theater program and Cornell, which is, <laughs> needs no introduction. Um, mm. So that's the sort of basic cherry arts landscape. So do you have a space? Or are you an ensemble? Yes. How does it work? Yeah, so both things are true. We have, um, we have, um, we are a collective of artists and um, uh, and in a sense, it's the collective that is the theater producer. Uh, we um, are mostly actors and a couple of directors and a few playwrights, um, Salviana Stanescu, who uh, fans of New York Theater and International Theater know uh, um, is in Ithaca a lot of the time. She teaches at Ithaca College and um, uh, Asia Stratford, a wonderful Australian uh, playwright, um, some other folks. Uh, and so we gather as a collective and read plays out loud, often from other countries or things that we're developing in house and uh, decide what we want to produce. And, and then we do that when we do it in a building at uh, almost always at the Cherry Art Space. And so that's our sort of uh, lovely home base. Um, it's just a, you know, it's just an empty box really. Um, uh, often the industrial side of town. Um, it's, a, it's a very small town. It still has all the parts that every city has. We have our industrial district. It's just very small and very close to all the other districts. So like uh, like um, black box raw performance spaces the world over, uh, that's, uh, that's where we are. And, um, and that has become a really wonderful um, uh, resource for the community. Um, uh, the, Ithaca has two, uh, we started this company knowing that Ithaca had already a wealth of theater, the Hangar Theater and the Kitchen Theater are both very like wonderful, strong established theater companies. Um, the Hangar does a summer season and uh, um, uh, like often family friendly, big family musicals uh, uh, sort of idea, although they do more and the Kitchen uh, advertises themselves as the kind of off-Broadway theater of Ithaca, you know, smaller dramas and comedies. And so it was really about finding a lane that was not occupied by already sort of taken care of. And so um, it turned out that there was a real appetite, not only for the theater that we make for um, uh, more international experimental work, but also um, the space itself, which we always named an art space rather than a theater. Um, uh, has been home to puppetry and sort of new opera and um, installation, video installation. We do lots of, we present lots of sort of neo cabaret, vaudeville, 
burlesque, um, uh, as well as more sort of gallery type installations, depending on the depending on who knocks on the door and is has an inspiring idea. How was the time of Corona for you and your company and Cherry Arts? It is it closed now? What are you doing? Yeah, the well, so the theater is uh, fascinatingly enough. Um, uh, at one moment, I thought to look on the website, and um, uh, since we are technically not a theater but a multidisciplinary art space, which is actually a government approved label, uh, we were allowed to reopen as an office space. So that was great because, you know, uh, I, I think we've all been feeling the um, difficulty of only working on Zoom and only working remotely. And so we have been able to gather our sort of very small skeleton team back in the space and we sit at tables far from one another. What time um, did you start again? What time? Uh, I'm gonna say end of summer in August that uh, um, we had uh, we took a little break in the summer, and then when we reassembled, we reassembled in person. And um, yeah, we put on mat we put on masks when we have to go to each other's table, or we just shout across the room. We put the uh, we had <laughs> we we had the um, we had the uh, air purifier put in the you know the the, the ultraviolet light air plant purifier put in our, our our you know air circulation system and when I, w I went into the space at, at night once and there was no light on and it was glowing this alien otherworldly light and it took me ages to figure out that that was we were nuking the air at all times no. uh, so this is a good tip to our friends in new york you declare the theater a multidisciplinary art space <clears throat> then you have more you uh, uh, more liberties um, uh -huh. we once we had, you know, the great Melanie Joseph was the founder and she came and uh, introduced the book. Uh, David Bruhn was the editor at, at Prelude. And she said, if I would be young artist, I would not stay in New York City. Just yeah. leave, yeah. basically. She said, it's no longer what it was. It's hostile. Um, mm -hmm. You want to experiment. It's not, this is not the place it used to be. So tell us, is that your experience? So the time of grown up artists are thinking, what do we do? What do we don't do? Um, I, I, how was it for you? I I, I start, wrestle with this question, Frank, so much because I I arrived in New York. I will now basically reveal. I arrived, arrived in New York in 1997 and was there for you know over 20 years. And uh, uh, at that time, right in the East Village, Soho, you could show up with a bright idea and a little bit of energy and put on plays in Manhattan all the time. You could and and that and you didn't need any money. You didn't need any, um, and and that was that's how I became involved with the Ohio Theater and eventually the New Ohio Theater and here oh and God. all these amazing places. Oh, totally, right? yeah. totally, totally. And um, and it's funny. I talk to the students here now. I'm frequently you know go into Ithaca College or Cornell to talk to the students, and it, I'm very. At the same time, though, even when you arrive in New York in ninety in ninety seven, you've always just missed the cool stuff. Like I had just missed Warhol and the factory, right? Like you always, so I'm very, I'm suspicious overall about these narratives of the like golden age that just got missed. That said, man, um, you know, and to talk to Robert Lyons, which I did recently, you'd like, um, there are still lots of small companies, you know, popping up and uh, it's, I, you know, I think more than ever, and who knows if this is true, but the sort of feeling of democratization of um, performance knowledge that is happening because of the internet. Like, you know, when I got to New York, I saw things at BAM and downtown at New York Theater Workshop. I saw Ivo Van Hove in his first show and, you know, before he was Ivo Van Hove at New York Theater Workshop. And um, I was just like, I can never see this in Vancouver. I would, I don't know how I would see this. And I don't know that that is true anymore for young creators. Um, and I would, and looking at what New York looks like now, I would rather go to a place where I would be able to get the keys to a warehouse and start making things in short order, which was what New York was really like um, back in the day. So it's, I, I came here after you know, deciding to build something, and I, we 
wrote a little press release and we put it out and so we're making a new theater and we're doing this kind of stuff. And the next day I got an email from Community Arts Partnership of our town saying, we read your press release. Why haven't you been in touch with us? We have money for people like you. And I was like, that, this is gonna be very different from New York City. <laughs> this is not what would happen. <laughs> um, Do you own your space? Pardon? Do you own your space? Yes, that is part of, um, I mean, I, you know, I say this uh, as though it, uh, no strokes of great fortune were involved. I, we do have the great good fortune to own the space. Um, basically, I had bought a little teeny apartment with help from my family and uh, that apartment, as they tend to do in New York, um, uh, skyrocketed in value. And when it was time to build something, it was like, okay, we can make a bare bones little warehouse in a small town. And, uh, and that, you know, I started my company after many years of freelance directing, and I did know some things that if I was going to start a company, I wanted to have a space. Um, and so that all became possible in a way that was very, very fortunate. Um, and then has been, um, you know, I think one worries then that it's a vanity project or something, but then it really filled up immediately with all of this amazing energy from the community. And it turned out that there was a real, uh, need here and so that's been super gratifying and exciting um and so tell us yeah. the ensemble idea you you say you use the word ensemble which mm -hmm. everybody who works in theater kind of dreams of so you you have one you... we do we have a collective um it's very loose we spent a lot of time talking early on about um about what it would be to be a collective. Um, it's very, you know, because everybody, and this is part of it, like this is part of it. There's um, the idea of being a theater artist in a way that is a full-time job, I think is really problematic in the US. Honestly, especially if you don't want to live in New York, like even if you do want it, like how many people really don't have a day job in our industry. I mean, certainly we can point to individuals who don't, but most be it teaching. And even I, I mean, I direct three or four plays a year for the Cherry Artist Collective, but I also run the company. You know, I do, I spend, I mean, I traded in a series of day jobs doing graphics for bankers or whatever for the day job of writing grants and supervising staff and um, running a small company. I prefer it. Um, I'm not necessarily better at it, um, but it, it in this case enables me to do um, to do the kinds of plays that the collective and I want to do, which is great. So I have more artistic meaning. But but basically, all of our collective members are, I, you know, if you're going to live in a place like Ithaca, you're going to teach, and then your teaching is a like a serious part of your artistic and life identity. I mean, maybe your gardening is a serious part of your life identity. Um, but it's all things that you can't really do in New York. And really the only place where um, theater work, where there's enough paying theater work around on the ground are these very big cities. And it's not for everyone to live in a very big city on a lifestyle level. So, um, so, it's, so we're a collective um, of professionals who are not, working to pretend that our full-time job will be theater. And that's, a, and, and, and that's an interesting, I think, piece of thinking that emerged from our brainstorming is that um, we're, uh, we're, we all work regularly and have long histories working professionally. Um, and, and we all teach or do other things in order to live in a smaller center that affords a different kind of quality of life. Um, I mean, that's a long way to say that it also makes the collective quite loose because someone can go on sabbatical, someone can have a year where they're working hard on writing a book or they have a very heavy course load and then they're very, they're less involved for that year. And then they lean back in when they're done. So it's a really, um, it's a great community. And I will say there's something that's very isolating about the job of theater director and or can be. And it's so great for me to program. I mean, I'm not saying everything we program, it becomes tremendously popular and is a huge hit, but I can say 
that it went through several rounds of readings with a large number of smart theater makers and there was enthusiasm from a couple of big roomfuls of those people and so i feel so then it's just a nice feeling where i don't i don't if if something goes over poorly i i don't kick myself quite as hard as i might it's just uh the 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 high i'm such a i'm a big believer in the hive mind you know the the wisdom of the hive brain so that's our so that's our cherry artist collective and um we recently started um when i first came to new york i interned and then worked at new york theater workshop so i i love those people i noticed that they had started putting at the beginning of everyone's bio the new york theater workshop previous credits first and we started to do that shameless <laughs> shameless fanboying um and um and it's an <clears throat> so gratifying to start to see like long lists of cherry collective productions at the beginning of everyone's um little yeah. uh, little bio you know it's like oh yeah. that's like a measurable sort of groundswell of work we've been yeah, putting together you hired artists you produced work you with with uh, actors and everybody but what is your why do you do theater what what's what's motivating you is it working yeah i mean the question i mean it's a question at the best of times and now it's a real question um i i i think um i think my answer my overall answer to the why is is not so different from many other people's in terms of it's a kind of addiction i think to that feeling of bringing everybody into a room and like other kinds of addictions it has these downsides and you're like wake up sweating and going why am i doing this but um so that that feeling of getting everybody together live in a room at the same time to make something extraordinary happen it will only happen then that will bring everyone together is so potent um and it really does beg the question, like, since we're not whatever we're doing, we're not doing that, is like, what are we doing? And, and the Cherry has, we've actually been very, very active artistically through the COVID um, moment. I think part of that was that we uh, had done so much experimental work, we were quite ready to look at a set of new set of parameters, a new set of challenges and say, what can we make within this? But it, but boy, it's a very tricky question. <sighs> Why we're doing it, I think I can come back to this feeling of addiction, like we're like, and I pick up the phone and say, we can't tolerate this. We have to make something. Everyone goes, yes, 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 let's make something. And some people, maybe the saner people are like, I, this is a time to, for reflection and this is a time to figure out what's going on. But we, that's not the way. We've been doing it, but it's very interesting. Frank, we did we did one play. We were the first folks in our area. I felt proud of this to do an actual live performance where people came together and watched live actors do a thing. So it was outdoors. It was all socially distanced. Audience sat in a park in pods, distanced from one another. Brought their own chairs. We painted circles on the ground, and the the cast was far from the audience and we did so we did a big commedia style farce which is not our normal sort of voice i guess but it was it was a blast it was really fun and and there was a huge outpouring of gratitude that was very moving and it was really great um but at the same time that feeling of audience togetherness was very um it was only a, an approximation of that. Like that we've read these studies of um, that everyone, that people's heartbeats synchronize in a theater, which is an amazing image that's so moving, especially now. Uh, and I know people's heartbeats did not synchronize in the park. They were too far apart. Um, and so the losses of this of making theater in this time are like animal losses they're not intellectual you know we can all read plays still 
and we can all stream pre-recorded plays and they can be done very, very uh, professionally. Um, but I do question how much of it is a kind of filmmaking just for a different audience base that's that wants to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was our production? Tell, I think Marvin Carlson told me about it. He wrote, I said, you know, since March, he did. the first thing <laughs> we saw. And so what did you do? And I just also now, I think from my Quebecois friends at the, uh, at the delegation, um, Taylor Gaines and Jean-Pierre Dion said, you know, you just did a work. So tell us about you were able to do work. What were the projects? Yeah, well, we did that. We were very proud. We announced a whole season. We announced we usually do four productions. We announced four productions. Um, and two of them, fascinating enough, we do, we do like um, uh, international plays and, we, and they tend to be like uh, structurally unusual relative to most US plays. And so we looked at the two that we were going to program anyway, and both of them seemed like they would lend themselves really well to a kind of live stream production. And we do, um, we do live stream, we do it like you show up at the time that the actors show up and we press go and they're really doing it then, and then we take it down. Um, and that, you know, they're all, I'm fascinated by all the conversations around this. Again, Robert at the New Ohio, one of my old longest standing collaborators in New York, and I feel exactly the same way that there has to be something happening live. Why? I don't know. Like, you know, could you tell if we faked it? Probably not. Um, so is it a ton of trouble? Yes. Um, so, but we do it. So that's, so we, we did this uh, live stream production of uh, A Day, a beautiful new play, uh, recent play by Gabrielle Chapdelaine, who's a young Quebec writer. Uh, she's amazing. And we did that. That was a fun collaboration. Our, our local big um, vaudeville house, the old, you know, big old vaudeville house that every town has. Ours is the state theater. It's a great organization. And they have been live streaming um, concerts. And so they have a really great, like robust um, streaming infrastructure. And so we rented the, the space and we'd put up four green screen booths and we, um, and we streamed from there. I wonder if I could, uh, I don't know if I, I said to myself, I was gonna pull up, put together pictures, but um, the morning got away from me. Uh, four, but it was four green screen booths, two cameras per booth and a big camera out front. And we live, mixed the video we had to build a camera uh, we had to build a computer effectively from scratch to, to accept nine video feeds at the same time and live mix them in real time uh so it was very exciting and a, and again a beautiful play and it and it got a it got what's been really interesting is we have sold more tickets to um we've told sold more tickets to this live, live stream work than we had been in in our previous season um, so there's something great about that. How much did you charge, and how how much did you charge, and how did people sign up? We did a uh, we did a, a sliding scale. You know, people came to our ticket, our regular ticket thing, and we just said 15 minimum, 25 recommended, 45 to support the artist. I haven't looked at the numbers of how many. When when we just said the power of suggestion, when we just said 15, 25, 45, everyone did 15 as soon as we said minimum and suggested everyone did 25. So that anyone who's listening who wants to do a sliding scale. Um, but so, yeah, and listen, we're a tiny company. We don't sell a vast number of tickets at the best of times. So um, so it's not like we were doing Guthrie numbers, <laughs> but we were doing, actually we were doing like solid off off Broadway numbers, like solid New Ohio <laughs> theater numbers. Um, uh, but the interesting, uh, I can say, just to go back to the Marvin Carlson, the outdoor piece, because uh, this was fun. And this is like, I think, a product of our, the good brainstorm in our, our collective. We want to do something outdoors. What are the things we can do? Live stream and outdoors. Um, and so we thought we'll do what, what are forms that work outdoors. And um, Commedia is not only designed to be performed outdoors, but to designed to be performed masked in a certain way. Comedia and the old Italian. Comedia, yeah. Exactly, Comedia dell'arte. And um, so we found a play that was immediately post comedia and we had been inspired by Crystal Pete, who's actually uh, a, a choreographer from Vancouver, but now making a really extraordinary avant-garde work in the Netherlands. And she had, um, there was a piece that was sort of going around Facebook called, um, 
uh, I forget what it's called, uh, but she, she has ballet dancers in suits dancing in a very austere but extremely heightened ballet way to a dialogue that sounds like a David Mamet play. Um, and they just dance it. Um, and so we hand this around, we were like, this is amazing. Well, what would it be like if we did this um, in a different register, say in a comic register? So that is in fact how the whole play, how we did the whole play, the, the cast was masked. And I immediately discarded the idea of like trying to sneak up mics behind the masks, like what a nightmare. Uh, and so we recorded the whole soundtrack, uh, the, the whole play. And this was great because our collective, many of them are my age and older and we're being very, you know, understandably cautious about COVID. Um, but have done season after season at the big theater festivals and can like bang out an audio um, performance of a classic play like very fast at a high level. And so we rehearsed for a week and we recorded was the it whole. A Goldoni play? I forget. It was a... Yes, it was. So I, I skipped that. It was a goal. It was Carlo Goldoni um, who, uh, Ever, most people will know from Servant of Two Masters, uh, who he did write 150 other plays and we spent ages digging through those because there's no real second place. Like all the other plays, like there are 30 other plays are tied for second place and they're a distant second. Uh, so we found one called The Fan that was just delightful and it's set outdoors and it's like, you know, a, just a really goofy story, which we all could use by then. Um, and so we masked the cast and I wonder, I wonder if I could do a screen share because um, it it was very fun to hang on um, to use these. To, 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 I'm being like a complete. I don't know if I have. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, oh, I don't. It's not enabled for me. Um, Maybe, but it was, yeah, you enable him in case you're listening. Yeah, but go on. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, it was really exciting. Like these masks that we all have to wear. You know, even even though hopefully we accept that one wears them and that it's important and it's your civic duty, um, they're a pain in the keister and nobody likes it. And it was really interesting and fun to kind of like claim the mask as a tool of expression and as and of comic expression actually. Um, so um, so it was it was really fun to have one of our, you know, our, our designers um, so like funny mouths, like cartoony mouths and beards and noses onto COVID masks, which enabled the cast, who was largely uh, younger people, to perform safely outdoors um and then um they could then completely like insanely heightened you know super heightened way physically embody the the dialogue that they were kind of not lip syncing because there are no lips but body syncing to um and uh in a way that actually no single person like you 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 could actually have an old person's unmistakably older voice speaking while a young person in kind of the long beard could fall down the stairs or whatever. In, yeah, and yeah. so, so in a, I mean, in a way it, 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 between that show and then this, this, it has been, I have to say a very, it, it was exciting. It's been a productive, um, um, sort of artistic time um, at the same time as it's so full of loss, you know, and so full of the things we can't do. Um, but it was, uh, um, uh, but so, uh, so, so yeah, you know, there are all of these experiences are, are, have been so exciting. I mean, by all, I mean, just even these last two, the fan and then a day, which are very different outdoors, super noisy, goofy. And then this kind of like cool live stream that was very formal. Like it was all about sort of rearranging, you know, highly 
So you separate the Denise Theta and Bunraku, or no, you separated the voice of the actor from the yeah. actor and use COVID masks as you know, uh, as a play with additional masks. Maybe over the time of the, our conversation, we can put you in uh, so you can show some images. So tell us a little bit about your community. Um, but yeah. How does it work? I mean, you said you got that email right away, but this was yeah. maybe from the department. Are people involved? Uh, do you know people on the street? Is it part of mm. the fabric? Did it take time? Do you think it will take more time? How does it look like? And how, just be honest with them, how, do, how real is that all? How I mean, it's real. It's real. I mean, this, I mean, <laughs> yes, if this is the sort of, um, is that, does that really, it really, um, the people come and people come from, um, uh, you know, we bring playwrights over from Paris and Berlin and Montreal and Bucharest and, uh, and uh, San Salvador. And it is like, so, it's so fun to, to, to see people's responses who are in all case, almost all cases come from very big cities, some of them much less comfortable than even New York. And it is like, we have a lovely space. We have extremely high caliber of acting and design. And, um, and we have tons of like creature comfort. It's really, you know, you, you can't sit in a cafe without people coming by and maybe their audience members or maybe their uh, supporters or maybe there are other actors or other artists um, but it is a really I mean the uh, it took me a lot I, when I moved to New York I thought I have found a place I am never gonna leave and you know, over 20 years it wasn't a bad guess but boy by the time I was ready to leave the small college town has a lot to recommend it um, and you do feel you know if you are listening and you are aiming to i mean what i really if i built a space what i wanted was to be full of people all the time and so when and i and i wanted to be not full of dumb stuff um and it just there was plenty of stuff that is really exciting and um people who didn't have a place necessarily to put it and so um so it's been really really great i mean i think i th i will say like on an organizational level it's always tough like it's always tough to um, build an infrastructure of fundraising and ticket selling and administration is, um, you know, that's the that's the part that you have to do. And there and and I and in the U.S. we are sort of under supported on these on these in, in these ways. Uh, so you have to spend a lot more. Time, like building infrastructure basically is building fundraising so that you can build infrastructure. And that's um, not a thing that, you know, like I'm not, that's not what my training is. Um, but, you know, on some level, it's just about speaking compellingly, enthusiastically about your work and I can do that. Um, and I will say like for the, I mean, since this is a real question, like it is easier it's easier here than in New York. Like it is easier, you know, if, if, if the young people, like just as Melanie said, if, they, if, if young people have a connection to anywhere in the country, like a mid-sized city, I could imagine this project being in a city that has a slightly bigger population because we cap out, you know, at a certain audience size, given that our work is kind of boutique. Um, uh, but yeah, if people have a connection to some mid-sized city, uh, you're going to still have access to super cool work either on the internet or by traveling. Do that, you know. But um, but I think uh, I think the idea of going to New York and trying to get attention there. I think for me the upside of New York was about seeing stuff. It, it you know the 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 hustle of trying to make work there and get attention for it you know, was all downside, <laughs> you know, I think that, I think the, I think the, the awesome split would be like, see some of the great, especially international stuff that comes to New York or to other big centers, and then make the work where you have some breathing room, you know, and, um, and where you have an audience that, that isn't, that, that you can really, um, uh, and audience, you can show something that they're, they're not otherwise going to see, I would say. I, I'm just seeing a thing. 
that makes me co-host. I wonder, I'll just show just the, I, um, there's a, it's just a picture of like. Oh, great. What, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, so this, this idea of just having fun with what a with a mask with a COVID mask as an expressive device was um, uh, was a thing that was really fun to do. And I have a, one other picture that I will uh, that was a kind of like um, oops that didn't that's the same picture. Um, sorry. Oh maybe I feel like I'm um, no I'm gonna just close that. There we go. That's the sort of like dance number at the end of the show and it was um you know it was all just day lit it was all you know another uh, i mean frank in this um in the way that you compared it to bunraku which i really appreciated it was really amazing to think about so all of these young actors are um doing fit are doing physical performances uh to um to, to, to vocal performances created by other actors. And we actually went out of our way, even for young characters, we wanted nobody to be doing the same, um, nobody to be voicing themselves because it, it just became an interesting uh, concept. And so um, the, um, then during it, there are downsides, like actors would say, you know, boy, it happens, even you get into the run and you have a whole idea for a new take on what's happening in a beat and you can't do it because you still got the same dialogue. Um, but at the same time, it was a way to reflect on this sort of intimate um, collaboration between two actors. And we often did a cross gender or cross racial or cross ethnic or cross, um, uh, you know, we try, we, or, or and definitely like differing ages. Um, we, we, we mixed that up a lot and it was really, it was really, I, you know, I don't know what it meant in the end, except that it was, a, it was a nice kind of uh, chaos to um, inject uh, and to, and, and a way to reflect on like, how do we express ourselves vocally and in, and through our bodies, and then how do those expressions speak to each other across different traditions and ages, and um, all of that? So that was like, well, you know, in between just trying to figure out the funniest way to fall down the stairs or whatever, you know, there were there the was some, of, uh, this was in the park, uh, yeah, yeah, in the park mm -hmm. in the middle of Ithaca in the town, yep. and everybody yeah. could just show up and went registered and went through a. You game. had to register. That was tricky. That was tricky because, you know, we were meant to keep the crowd, the gathering to 50. And everybody knows if you're listing something for free, you, um, uh, you can get up to 50% of no shows. And so it wouldn't have been practical for us to um, say, okay, 50 people have said they will come. Therefore now nobody else can come. Um, so it will it all end up being pretty loosey goosey uh, that we did our best. It was all like kind of um, uh, that I would say the city worked with us very, very carefully and effectively. And they were very, I mean, they really liked, they were like, you know, the, the fact that we came to them saying like all the live performers are gonna wear masks um, all the time. That's the thing that I think it's very hard to achieve. And that was what they sort of needed to have be true at the time. And then in terms of socially distancing the audience and all that, we did the things you'd expect and that all worked out. Um, yeah, great. That's behind you. If you have a couple of pictures maybe of your space, uh, your art space, yeah. um, 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 while, we, um, while we talk sure. to you, are you conversing now? What's, what, you, what is your practice? Like, let's say this week, what are you doing? Uh, well, so the, the, a day, the, the, the big one that we just did was kind of um, such a big project that right now I am, I would say we're all sort of recovering <laughs> and we are, we're in that sort of like week and a half of like, <sighs> and um, then we are, um, uh, and then, um, and we're, and we're like looking at fundraising and we do have a, you know, doing that like end of year annual fundraiser, which is a small company. It's like, these are the things like you find yourself, that's the price of making the work, you know? Um, 
So, uh, uh, and we're just starting on um, our, in February, we have our second live stream show. The, the season we announced was like outdoors, streaming, streaming, outdoors. And so the second live stream show is a super cool play from Mexico, um, Alejandro Ricano, um, who I don't know if he's ever crossed your path and um, he's think. very, He's very cool, super smart, chic, young writer, but prolific. Um, and this will be his first production in English. Um, uh, and his play is called Hotel Good Luck. And in that interesting way, it is called Hotel Good Luck in Spanish. You know, the one absolutely untranslatable thing is the sound of the English language in a foreign language. So uh, I regret that we can't really say what, translate the title, but um, it's a great play about a kind of like, it's like sort of lonely late night radio host guy who uh had like kind of like five people listen to his station and he um and he has a big life loss and then goes into a kind of um parallel universe thing of enacting what it would be like to not have entered that loss but then of course there are other losses it's in a funny way as I recall, it's been a while since I read it, but Rabbit Hole, the David Lindsay Abair play, is about a speculation of the parallel universe idea and um, loss. But of course, it's that's as in the sort of living room drama form, and this is in a completely kaleidoscopic, crazy form. Right. So that's Hotel well, Good Luck, and yeah, sure, loss is a that's going to be an, an important theme for many many right. years to come. Um, let me ask you uh, the, regarding the Mexican writer. You know. Um, let you yeah. take some uh, New York theaters, let's say the Signature, Playwrights Horizon, also New York Theater Workshop, and to a large extent the public, they are American plays in the mm -hmm. theme of like North American, you know, mostly God Man, mostly <laughs> um, and, um, and uh, I mean, there's the play company that does great international plays, mm -hmm. but not, not so many. But now you are in Ithaca but you take pride, and if you look at your production history, it's so international, it's a global scale. In New York is so diverse, yeah. you know, we have a majority of New York City is no longer white. I think 160 languages are spoken. Isn't that crazy? On, space, on stage. Why do you, what's your idea behind, behind your artistic vision then? Why do you do that? Are they not good enough, the uh, American <laughs> or... <laughs> Yes. Um, you know, I think it's so funny. It's so, like, I... Uh, I find that for myself, I mean, to come up really personally, I, 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 I'm a director, right? I'm not a writer and I'm not a divisor. Um, sorry, just sort of reset my ears. Um, uh, and, I, and I did find myself, and I'm the kind of director I am, I don't really come out of acting training. I don't really come out of like, let's find the deeper dive into this naturalistic scene between these actors. So I found at a certain point in my career, I was, just was like, Long story short, for me personally, the ways in which plays get written in other countries um, stretches a director more and an ensemble more. It's not there. Um, boy, the, I, I, I have struggled to understand why it is that um, in film, for example, the measure of your sophistication, right, as a cineast, is that you watch international films you know, the angelic or wherever you go to the, your first run and it's and it's all about international films and that's a measure of how cool are you, like that you're not stuck in a Hollywood and not that New York theater is a good analog for Hollywood filmmaking, but is it like, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's, I have felt like there are plays, Frank, that like this play called George Kaplan, again, an English title, it's called George Kaplan in French, um, George Kaplan um, by a guy named Frederick Sontag that's been produced all over the world, like 15 productions translated into dozens of languages. We did, not only did we do the English language premiere, but I translated it and how, like, and that's three years ago. We were nobody, like how did we, that was such a get, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not perceived really as a get here because if one's like, let's well, play from France, you know, um, I, I don't, I, I've, I, so the part of the dawn of this was just traveling. I would see, we, I spent a sabbatic with my partner in Argentina and I was so knocked over by, I mean, basically the travel, um, 
the lesson of travel kind of for me is always, oh, things that we thought were the way the world is are really completely contingent and only operate that way in my city. Um, and so just going to plays and being like, oh my God, look at the, look at the crazy variety of things that people can put on stage in Buenos Aires in a completely different, super sophisticated, huge theater town that would just not be accepted in New York um, because they're just not what a play is or they're not good um, uh, was really mind blowing and super exciting. And that is that was actually in a sense that when I came to Ithaca to, you know, rope together this ensemble, um, that that was what I really wanted to do was to sort of say, uh, uh, you know, let's just see what is being written in other countries and how and and um, and I do think there's a politics to it. I do think that, I mean, we only have to look around our political world to see the sort of toxicness of kind of America first. And, uh, but, uh, but I do feel like there's a kind of um, American exceptionalism feeling that is in New York theater, um, even among, I mean, I've had people who are, firmly on the side of US theater should be more international say, but you're just never gonna sell the tickets. I can think of two conversations with like high up people who are really in it, who are like, no one's ever gonna sell them, just like spare yourself the grief. Um, and then, um, um, and, and, I, and I remember again from Argentina, this is many years, five years, over eight years ago now, uh, emailing a company, like an exemplary, really cool alt New York company and being like, I found a playwright in Buenos Aires who's crazy famous here and all through Latin America. And she is a playwright who is exactly in this world like the voice of your of your company. And the answer came back, we have new American plays right in the mission. That's just like what we do. And I was, and then I looked around and I was like, oh my God, so many people have new American plays in the mission. It's, it's somehow, no, I don't know why. Just to make sure it has, it cannot, if it's not American, they will not do it. They, they, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, like another the endowment of the arts often is, you know, you apply so little money out there, you put in international collaborator, you're out by default. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, <clears throat> we got told that, um, <clears throat> that we have to be careful about leaning too much on certain, for certain government agencies, we have to like, I mean, okay, every application you spin it a little bit to the interests of the grantor, but but it was interesting to be like, oh, we have to spin away from, mm -hmm. it can't feel like we're servicing international artists. So, yeah. Who was the, the Argentine writer, by the way? Pardon? Who was the, Who was the writer? Yeah. Oh, the Argentine writer was Romina Paula. Um, okay, uh, well, yeah, yeah, we just did some readings for her with her. Oh, uh, great. I, I, I have literally have no idea what she has written since then. She had a new piece that was, uh, well, anyway, um, I forget what it was called. Yeah. Um, and I mean, she's a, like a rock star. She's a novelist, a movie star, a rock star. She's just like such a sort of glamorous figure. I was like, oh, she like, yeah, she could bring her into New York, no problem. And everyone was like, eh. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. It's very surprising. It's very surprising. And, it's, um, and I mean, there is, I have been, you know, they're just like a certain number of hours in a day. I, I've been dying. I feel like many cities have a small alt theater company that is or would be interested in an international play. The people who do the alt plays, maybe not the main stage of the given city, but the alt stage or whatever. Um, and I would love to create a network where we can, because, you know, I would say I spent a significant amount of time digging out plays from other countries and then we read them. And then many of them are like good plays in that country, but wouldn't resonate in the United States and we discard them. Like we find our way, it's like we have a tricky little way to find our way to these plays. And now we've got like eight, you know, 10 that we've produced. And um, I'd love for there to be an anthology or just a way to get, get the word out. Um, because that is, of course, the downside of making, if, if it is one of making the work in a small community, you know, the size of your audience is limited. And then that's the very interesting thing about this online moment, because we sell, so our, our, our Ithaca ticket sales 
fell 50% when we went to online streaming stuff, but it was literally more than made up for by national level ticket sales. And that really starts to make one go, well, when we are back in, I think we all, we always said the pandemic will change things, but it was very difficult to say how, but we were all like, get ready. Things are gonna be different and stay different. And one of the things for us is like, we're looking going, why on earth, like when we go back to an on, like a live on stage version, we'd be crazy not to build in a streaming, like, and I mean, foundationally build in artistically a live stream component so that people can have not the same experience, but a full, a fully thought through artistic experience of the play, streaming it at the same time that people are having uh, a live experience of the play. And that's very, very exciting for me, actually. You watch a, a Lady Gaga concert or yeah. on MTV yeah. or on, a, on a HBO, but you will still go to the concert and it's even better because you saw it, you know, and the differences um, and between it. No, it's, it's stunning. It's also a great testimony to the town of Ithaca that they said, this is a company we like. This is work we would yeah. like to propose. It has something to do with us. With, perhaps with the campus, the university. So, you know, it mm -hmm. certainly makes it an interesting, attractive town. And what's the, you know, always has done, but it has to be a real engagement. It can be, you know, a, a, a pretend one. And um, so um, what if, in your ideal world, you know, what, what would you like to do? Let's say the, the Ithaca town would say, what, Sam, what do you need? What would you like to do? What, what would be something, what do, you, what do you think, what could you do there that, uh, did you know there's an interesting there's an interesting moment happening, of course, with uh, with We See You, uh, as well as with I think, I mean, anything in particular. Um, both other companies that I described, the Hangar in the Kitchen, are undergoing sort of organizational transitions um, that are coincident with this, like um, mm -hmm. with this thing, with the with COVID, and of course we are. are I mean, there are elements of the Cherry Company infrastructurally that have certainly been shaken and destabilized like how what, what does income look like what does staffing look like oh i think everybody has been no company i can has come out of this sort of sailing smoothly along their trajectory and i think it is a real it's a real moment um i think we can get away with a lot in terms of our audiences i think one thing that i've noticed about u.s theater compared to but I've now seen a fair amount of international theater and talked to people about how it runs. We are so box office driven that we are, as opposed to funding from government, et cetera, or, or corporate sponsored, um, we are we often are forced to program from a place of fear of our subscribers' wrath. And I think that is unfortunate, but I think it is also the case. And I think this is a moment when any institution can turn to their subscribers and say, hey, we need to make some changes. And these changes can be for better artistic outcomes, better social justice outcomes, better um, uh, community engagement outcomes. Uh, and we can sell that <laughs> to the subscribers <laughs> and the donors by saying, everything is out the window. We live through a global pandemic. Things are going to be different and here's how they're going to be different. I think it's a, I do think it's an opportunity to say, um, I mean, it might be an opportunity. I mean, it, we were already experimental and we cracked open our creative processes even more in ways that will endure, I think. Um, so maybe, I hope it's a time where we can come out at the other end um, really having having dug deep and learned things and been forced to innovate and then we can hang on to that innovation and i and i don't and i don't want it to sound cheap because i hear i hear a lot i despair sometimes when i hear people i hear like people um saying idealistic things and hopes and then other people echoing those hopes who are in positions of power. And I know that those echoes are um, false, are like lip service, because I know they're thinking, mm -hmm. there's no way I can implement that. And, um, but the easiest, the path of least resistance right now is for me to say, absolutely, that's a great idea. And we're going to do that. Um, I feel like I've seen that. My, I will be as vague as necessary. I've seen that over the past months and it's disheartening. 
uh, because I do actually think that a lot of real things can happen, and I think it, and I think it will come from the sort of shatteredness of the model now. Um, and I hope that people take seriously. I hope that people in positions of greater power than me are taking seriously the possibility to really reinvent things. So Probably Black Lives Matter, it had an impact in Ithaca. Was it felt on the streets in the town in York? Say again. Black Lives Matter. Was it felt in the town of Ithaca? Was oh, yeah. it felt? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, I mean, it's very, um, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, we're feeling it in a very specific way. I mean, we feel in a very tough way because we are a town with something like a three and a half percent black community. Um, there's a constant um, churn, even at the universities where faculty of color come and, uh, or staff of color and, um, after three years are like, this town is too damn white and I'm out. And that's obviously a self-perpetuating, self-fulfilling prophecy. And that also is a response to acts of uh, racism from white people here who, you know, are very accustomed to having run the show. And um, that is uh, like, I think uh, myself and a lot of people didn't want to believe that was true. It's like, oh, we're all, you know, every, everybody here in Ithaca is very enlightened because we're all university people or spouses or whatever. And it's completely not true. It's a completely, I mean, and I, I, I am embarrassed of my naivete to, to I'm admitting that I kind of had that complacency and um, it's completely not true. Uh, and it's been a terribly sort of racist situation for a lot of people who have come here. Uh, under good, um, with good intentions. And so, so for us, it's just about even trying to keep the community diverse. And I mean, we're also an ensemble and, um, uh, you know, who is made up of members of the community. And so how do we diversify the ensemble is the thing we're taking very seriously. Uh, um, how do we, you know, we're doing international work. How do we make sure that work is not all like Europe, you know, we and we want the work to really resonate. We want it not to be homework. We want it, we want it to be like a great place that you go to and have a great time. So there can't be so huge a gulf between our culture and the culture of the play that comes from. That's the thing that I, I've discovered. So, but so how do we then make sure that it's not all like Germany, France, Canada? <laughs> um, Latin America has been very fruitful. You know, we have wonderful collaborations in Latin America, so that's helpful. But the global South, aside from South America. Has, we have not yet gotten into the Middle East. Um, we're really, so that I would say has lit a fire under all of us to, to try to, again, like use this opportunity of fracture, of rupture, of destruction, frankly, to build something up that's a more that's equitable. Right. So and what so what inspires you? I mean, we're coming closer to the end. What what do you in this time? Do you watch online theater? You watch films? What do you read? What do you listen to? And how do you oh, keep wow. your mind uh, sharp? No oh, boy, uh, um, it's very uh, you know. I get outside. Right recently, I'm getting outdoors. I'm uh, I just uh, I I read a couple of novels after the show went up. That was great. I um, oh I oh, by the way, uh, write novels. No, I read a couple of them. Oh, you read? Okay. I got back. I got what back to read? fiction. What did you read? <laughs> I read one great novel called um, "Paul." Paul becomes a Paul transforms into a real girl. Something like that is super queer. Super like it was like a kind of like sci-fi gender fluidity. It was great. It was super fun. And then I read an Anne Patchett, the recent Anne Patchett novel, which was almost like too, too much of a lovely product. And then you realize after you're like, oh, but I had to, she, she forced some filler pills in that beautiful and Patchett packet. Um, <laughs> so it was, uh, that, that, so that's what I, that's what I read recently. I missed doing pottery. I had just started getting into pottery when all this hit. And that was a great way to like clear the uh -huh. old brain cells. So you had to kill them somewhere uh, in Ithaca. <laughs> it was a great, Collective and I, I let me show a picture of the art space. By the way, yeah, do, we go. Be... so do people? How does it work? Can playwrights send you plays, or do you give 
companies that's a, <clears throat> rent, can you rent it out what just yeah you can totally rent it out um you can totally rent it out for event. i mean you could when events were allowed you could totally rent it out um this is the this is the art space in its denuded form we've got a we've got sort of like platform um a sort of uh, modular platform system and uh chairs and all that um and um the but, brown you know, it's a brown box. It's so yes, exactly. I I, I work for I, actually so many universities in black boxes, and I found they like suck the energy out of me. Yeah, I just yeah. need more yeah. light. Um, so yes, it's a plywood box. Uh, and uh, right, and you can see the canal. And we have a little view of the river, which is super nice. Um, so I would say, sadly, um, the uh, U.S.-based playwrights can. Don't don't send us plays because we're not on that list. Um, but um, uh, and so we won't be able to read them. Uh, but we love you and we are um, pleased by how much support there is for U.S. playwrights in U.S. theater companies. Even though I know it is not an easy road. Mm -hmm. um, but I but but um, uh, the people who I if anyone is listening to this who's like a cool theater company somewhere who's like, oh, I want to know about these like awesome, weird ass, super cool international plays. Give us a buzz and we can like trade some ideas. Um, and um, yeah, when we're producing, come up to Ithaca and, and check mm -hmm. us out. Um, or maybe more productions, you know, across this. Yeah. Chicago, Darusa or others. Who knows what might come out of this uh, Corona time that is spaces like yours. Totally. You know? I was going to say, oh, check out like the the I'm sure obligatory plug. Check out on February, Hotel Good Luck by Alejandro De Cano is going to be really beautiful. Also live stream, very different from a day, um, but also really cool. We'll be at your space at Cherry Arts. Uh, that actually, that one we're actually also doing from the State Theater, which is kind of cool. It's kind of I mean I think that one we're going to do. The a day was extremely mediated. Like there were literally 400 video cues of cuts between different cameras and this one would and this one i think is going to be one long take like one mm -hmm. one man one person moving with a camera and one one two and two actors mm -hmm. um but how and, interesting uh, that small, smaller places like you're relatively smaller can go in big spaces for what right. <laughs> yeah. what are they and doing something is completely it would have been unthinkable before to go for four evenings in a big house now it's absolutely to, um, to use uh, resources and spaces maybe also that could be uh, something for the future you know that small companies might use the thousands of these out and they'd be all and they going to get 50 or 100 audience members I anyway that's yeah. fantastic. Well, Sam, really, really, um, um, thank you for uh, for uh, for joining us and uh, well, for sharing your invitation. You know, we think it's important, you know, to democ democratize, as you say, the access to the arts. We think access to healthcare, access to the education, access to the arts are yeah. fundamental human rights. And um, and I think because of the funding structures, you know, the uh, the regions outside the very very big cities having a little bit of a harder time. So you're doing a great service. To American theater, there's also a great tradition of great regional companies, and which produces high, high quality work, and innovative, and also is exploring in the right seeing things that isn't being done in other places. So it's a, a, a real important um, contribution um, that you're making. You, so Frank. really, really thank you, and it adds a bit to the puzzle of what's going on in the time of Corona in American theater and um, also globally and there are so many cross connections tomorrow we will have uh, with us uh, helen shaw the critic you know the great great one who was also once our mm -hmm. great curator to hear what does she think what is she seeing what is uh, 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 she observing and uh, well, from a point of view of a critic and then the great birdie fortman who is a professor of theater but a so dramaturg a teacher director but mostly concerned with on-site, as she called it, you know, theater, site-specific, but she calls it on-site, mm. to do something on the site where you are with the international overview. So she will talk about the many other things about uh, about that. So um, really, this was a really illuminating. Thank you for sharing. Congratulations. It's Thanks, easy Frank. for us to zone in and out. Hey, this is what he does. But you have built this over years. After 20 years in New York, you made a big decision. Now you have worked five, six years there are seven, it often takes seven years to get something started. But it's an important uh, 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 thing to say also for young artists, as you said, you know, really think about it as an alternative 
to um, the metropolitan or cosmopolitan supremacy idea, though. Only <laughs> from there, it's, it's valid, valid and uh, on one way it's true, on the other way it's not. First, you want to be respected by your peers and then by institutions and by cities. Uh, so I think so the most important is to do good work and perhaps to develop work in the time we live in now. This is truly something that is working and you can do productions and even New York Theatre Workshop cannot, didn't do it, <laughs> whatever, as far as I'm at, because it's a different thing. And uh, you, they can't, you know, not their fault, um, but it's impossible yep. by, by the structure. Yep. But you decided to work in another structure. So um, really, really um, thank you. And to our listeners, so thanks for taking time out of your busy life. There's so, so much more on when we started in March early on. So there was very little uh, in these conversations. We're happy to see more and more. But uh, it really it means a lot that you take the time uh, and listen to it. And thanks to Hal Run for being so patient with us for now over 100 talks to EIVJ and also to Andy Lerner from the Seagull. Thank you. And Sam, uh, good luck. And uh, are you going to go back to the rehearsal today or tomorrow in that space? <laughs> I go straight. I go straight to the theater from here. Absolutely. Well, with your own with your own yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. fantastic. Good luck and uh, really congratulations. And, uh, Congratulations to the city of Ithaca also, you know, for being a host to, to a subject. Yeah.